Well, hi, everybody, and welcome back. This is the third part in our uh, four-part series, Global Address Cleansing. Today, we're going to be discussing address matching and deduplication. I really think you're in uh, for, for something special today. I think this is going to be one of our best yet, one of the most interesting. Uh, my name is Ben, and I'm one of our solution specialists here at WinPeer. I'll be your host today. If you uh, missed parts one or uh, two of this uh, of this series, uh, please check us out on YouTube where you'll find the recordings and lots of other useful content. Part one was an overview of global address cleansing problems and solutions. Part two was focused on general hygiene, cleansing and normalization. And today we're covering the next piece here, which is address matching and deduplication. Anyone registered for, uh, for this webinar will receive an email once we finish up today. That email will also contain links to more information, a link to the recording, and a link to my online calendar if you'd like to discuss anything in more detail. For a trial version of our software or for more information, you can visit us at winpeer.com or you can send us an email to sales at winpeer.com. Taking a look here and it, you know, it looks like we've got a, another awesome turnout today. So thank you all for joining. We really appreciate your time, your interest, your attendance. Hopefully this is uh, very helpful for everyone. Keep in mind that everyone on the call is on mute. Uh, and I'll try to leave time for questions towards the end of this webinar. Um, so feel free to submit any questions that you might have in the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. If we can't take your questions live, uh, please feel free to email me directly. Or again, you can pick a time on my calendar to discuss any questions that you might have. So let's, uh, let's take a, a quick look at uh, the agenda for today. We've already taken care of the introduction, so we're gonna start with the recaps of part one and part two, your key takeaways there. Then we're gonna move into common problems and solutions for address matching and deduplication. Finishing up today with a brief demonstration of Clean and Match Enterprise so you can see it all in action. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, some of the points here from the recap. So the, the first part of this series was focused on the five most common address quality dimensions or criteria uh, and the effects on other processes and outcomes. The key takeaway during this first part of the series was that there are a variety of different requirements surrounding address quality and that it basically boils down to being fit for purpose. Uh, each uh, business area, of course, might have different requirements. The, the second part of this series, we went much more in depth about address hygiene, uh, which includes data profiling, cleansing, and normalization. The key takeaway from part two of this series was that uh, uh, general hygiene is, is really just the first layer of usefulness, uh, which can impact uh, the uh, other processes and outcomes, such as data matching, deduplication, address verification, uh, and otherwise. So again, keep in mind, jump in uh, and jump out, um, which is why we're doing this four-part series on global address cleansing. There's a lot to know. Uh, address hygiene is a big topic. And so is address matching and deduplication. It's not nearly as straightforward as you might think. Uh, address verification, postal certification, and enrichment, all of these topics are important, right? So let's go ahead and uh, start with uh, some of the address matching and deduplication problems and challenges. So if you think about, uh, you know, a variety of different uh, common uh, business activities, Maybe you need to merge a couple of customer files and you need to deduplicate addresses to see how many unique uh, households uh, you have. Or maybe you need to integrate data from different areas of the business and you need a single customer view. Now, why wouldn't uh, the name and the address information match? Why might you have multiple unique customer IDs for the same customer? Well, it's important to remember that uh, that data is just essentially a digital description of real world people, companies, 
locations, events, transactions, products. And these descriptions are always somewhat unique, right? There's a variety of different ways to describe things, uh, even if they're describing the same piece of information, which they often are. If I asked everyone in this webinar right now to just type in a simple description into the question box, uh, just our complete company name, how many different descriptions do you think we might get? You can see on the screen here, obviously, lots of different ways to do it. And if I then entered those names into our CRM, how many duplicates do you think we'd have? Right? There are, uh, you know, there's a lot of fragmented information. There are an infinite number of possibilities here. And keep in mind that addresses are uh, longer strings of less structured text. So there's a much higher level of variance in those descriptions. So it's really important to understand here that there is a very high level of variance in the descriptions and that business systems and applications are programmed to identify information that matches exactly, right? Without any data entry errors or differences. Now with that context, let's go ahead and look at a few uh, examples here uh, of the most common address uh, matching and deduplication problems. Right, the, the first one here is just ones and zeros. So not having specialized address matching tools in place or not taking it serious enough, right? Again, the, you know, two, two different instances of essentially the same piece of information will rarely match exactly. There's almost always going to be some differences in the way that the address and other data is, is, is represented there. Uh, the second one here is raw data. And raw data is, is rarely useful for business purposes. You know, we, we covered this in detail uh, on part two. You know, it requires cert a certain level of cleansing, preparation, and transformation uh, for each use case, right? For each area of business. Raw data is usually uncleansed and lacking normalization, or it might even be clean and organized and standardized, but if it doesn't match your standards and your requirements, then ultimately it's not fit for purpose, right? Again, we touched on that uh, during part two here. The next one is having multiple addresses. And if you think about it, businesses often have multiple locations, uh, each location with different shipping and billing addresses. So you know, this is a very common issue for vendor data or when, you're when your customers are companies. Uh, people, uh, like consumers, uh, often move and change addresses and have multiple homes, work addresses, physical and mailing addresses. So those, you know, addresses that you have in your systems might be valid, uh, but they're not necessarily describing the same location. So again, in context about matching addresses or even deduplicating addresses, this is gonna be another thing that, that's obviously gonna make that more challenging. The next one here are the, uh, the unit numbers, the apartment numbers, the suite numbers, office numbers, things like that. And again, in context, let's remember that addresses are usually longer lines of less structured and less standardized text, right? Again, it's, it's, it's a longer line, it's, it's, it's a description ultimately with a high level of, uh, of variance or variability there. And, and uh, again, these are unique descriptions of locations. So, you know, these small differences in addresses like unit numbers or apartment numbers, they can make a really important difference when you're data matching uh, or, or, or doing some kind of deduplication. Sometimes the problem isn't finding the matches. Sometimes the problem is finding the right matches, essentially doing that accurately. You know, these unit numbers or apartment numbers, office numbers, things like that, often make it really difficult to differentiate between, uh, for example, neighbors with similar addresses. Now, the next one here is outdated uh, addresses. And again, it's just another level of challenge. It's another thing to take into consideration when you're doing any kind of address matching or deduplication. And an old address may still be valid based on bank information for payment purposes, but trying to match that old address to a more current address uh, obviously could be a challenge for you. So again, having different information or outdated information is a very common challenge. Lastly here is uh, just incomplete uh, information, incomplete addresses, missing information, missing city names, missing apartment numbers, postal codes, 
uh, so on and so forth. So those are some of the most uh, common address matching and deduplication challenges. Let's go ahead and skip to the next slide here. What we're going to look at now and, and very briefly are just uh, some of the uh, the effects on, on processes and outcomes, some of the different opportunities and business problems. Um, I've listed a few really interesting stories here and I'm happy to share the studies if anyone wants to send me an email. Data matching uh, is really kind of a keyword, right? So, you know, we use it quite a bit and, and obviously there, there, uh, there are some, you know, a variety of different uses for that. But data matching essentially describes the most effective solution to problems of duplication. It's also a key uh, to identifying less obvious relationships between people, like your customers, your contacts, your employees, locations, objects, communities, and other information assets. So a few examples here just to, uh, just to put this into context. The first one is a study on duplicate healthcare records in the Twin Cities. So this study found uh, that the primary causes of duplicate healthcare records were simple data entry uh, errors, right? Something we've been talking about here. Um, a few other key takeaways here. The study also estimated the annual cost of, of duplicate healthcare records to cost the hospital, in this case, $50 per pair of duplicate records just in hidden operational costs, right? That might be the first time you've heard that term. They also concluded that uh, duplicate healthcare records did have a negative impact on patient safety, which is really kind of a big takeaway here. Uh, those duplicate medical records were compromising or are compromising critical medical decisions. So if you couple all of that with the cost of the external cleanup effort that they paid for, the estimated cost of duplication in this scenario would likely exceed seven figures annually. And that's without regard to the real world consequences that we mentioned, again, impacts on, on patient safety and, and obviously so many other possibilities there. It's a very interesting case study, happy to share that with you. Now let's talk about Starbucks. Uh, has anyone paid attention to their uh, double digit growth over the last 15 years? So in, in 2008, uh, when the global financial crisis took place uh, and when the retail sector took one of the biggest hits, Starbucks did something very different. So instead of buying more online uh, advertising like most of their competitors, Starbucks decided to invest in their own cross-channel marketing technology capabilities to engage customers in new mobile platforms and social media. So Starbucks invested in personalized communications to enhance the customer experience and to fuel their customer loyalty program, which has been a really big success. Now, there were a few key challenges here and data matching uh, was one of them. To do this successfully, they needed to A, collect large amounts of disparate data. Uh, again, this is uh, essentially descriptions of their customers and their customers' buying behavior, uh, among other things. They needed to B, uh, cleanse the data to ensure a single customer view, right, aka data matching. And they needed to C, uh, create uh, consumer profiles. So as an organization, Starbucks attributes most of their growth over the years uh, to the success of this one initiative, to the success of this one investment. Their stock went from uh, less than $20 a share before 2008 to more than $80 a share in 2020, right? So again, I have that study. I'd be happy to share it with you. Lastly, here's an article from the Harvard Business Review re referencing a large industrial company and their supplier data. Uh, the article references a large industrial company is having a very common problem. And here at Wimpure, we've seen it thousands of times over the years. This company had multiple different business systems, each with critical business information. And supplier names were just slightly different from system to system. So each area of business was working with their own set of information, right? Data matching helped this organization to better understand their relationships with their suppliers, to negotiate much better pricing on their purchasing. And here's the key takeaway. 
The first year business benefits were estimated at about $75 million. They were spending way more than they needed to, right? So three very, very powerful stories there. Having the right data matching tools is critical for master data management. You know, if you think about the initial uh, MDM load, integrating disparate uh, data from different business units, the regular batch loads, the real-time interactions, searching. Again, you're dealing with, you know, uh, gigabytes, terabytes of, uh, of descriptions, right, that, that are going to be very unique from, from system to system. Uh, and, you know, is, you know is the, the data matching is used in a variety of other activities as well. Uh, following a merger and acquisition, companies need data matching to integrate customer and supplier data from different uh, sides of the, uh, the merger or the acquisition. Data matching is also used to match airline passenger lists with no-fly lists. Fraud prevention is another one, matching internal company data to, uh, you know, different blacklists, government blacklists, financial uh, blacklists, things like that. So there are a dozen, you know, or tons of, of different use cases for data matching and deduplication. Hopefully it should be pretty clear that, you know, data is just a digital subscription of these real life, uh, you know, entities. And data matching is needed to identify uh, less obvious relationships. So there are tons of problems and opportunities just waiting for the right uh, business sponsor. Let's go ahead and look at uh, some of the uh, address matching and deduplication uh, practices and solutions here. So what we've done this far, we've talked about why these problems exist, right? Some of the potential effects on other processes and business outcomes. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the best practices when it comes to uh, address matching here. Just a quick time check, great. So the first is uh, data profiling. Now, again, we, we, we talked about this at length uh, during part two. Please check us out on YouTube if you haven't seen that. Uh, again, the goal here is to quickly ascertain the usefulness of the data as the best practice for data matching, deduplication, or using the data for any other purposes. We wanna go source by source and column by column. Our data profiler allows you to do that. When profiling, we want to better understand the content, the structure, the validity of the data. We want to understand the completeness of each data set, column by column. We also want to understand the uniqueness of the data, column by column. Other important considerations might be how much noise we should expect in each field or how much standardization might be required. Match prep, uh, this, is, this is a good topic. There are a variety of different ways to prep the data to get better match results or, or, or better deduplication results. And uh, I've got a few of those techniques here and we're gonna look at uh, a few things during the demonstration as well. So the first are the match keys, right? Match keys, an example here uh, might be matching on words only numbers only or data from a few select columns. So working with an address, for example, removing the numbers from the address field to be able to match on the, on the words only, right? That's kind of an example there. Address splitting, right? We talked about this during uh, part two, parsing or, or structuring to make the uh, data or the addresses more organized, more standardized and easier to work with. Column merging, uh, this is essentially merging columns of data for uh, match purposes. Standardization, we talked about this during part two. Uh, for example, replacing Los Angeles with LA or NYC to New York, vice versa, things like that. Also, uh, verification and enrichment, and there are different types of verification and enrichment. Uh, we're gonna look at address verification and enrichment during part four, I hope you'll join us. Uh, there are some other types of verification and enrichment as well that we'll get into during uh, other uh, webinars. Uh, and, you know, again, for address verification, this is, um, you know, verifying the addresses that you have and adding more data on top of what you already have to, to be able to improve upon uh, the results from data matching or uh, deduplication. Um, so let's go ahead and look at this last one, match configuration. You can see that on the, the lower left there. Let's look at this in more detail because this is what we're gonna uh, cover during the demonstration here. It is really the match configuration, right? Beyond the match prep. 
uh, beyond the you know additional verification enrichment that can be done. There are a variety of techniques used to make adjustments to uh, the algorithms and how the algorithms are working uh, through the match configurations, right? And you'll see this right in the software. If you haven't been trained on the software, I'm happy to take you through it. Uh, an algorithm in itself is much more powerful and much more effective uh, than you know the different checks you might have in your business applications looking for you know exact matches or near exact matches but there are a series of other you know configurations and other considerations uh, the first here is fuzzy matching and blocking and this is essentially the first layer of match configuration these are ways to adjust the levels of tolerance for matching and mismatching data right the next one here are levels and weights, and this allows you to increase or to reduce the levels of error tolerance and weight of the data in each column. Right? This is all kind of you know, theoretical, but we're going to look at this during the demonstration. Uh, the next is groups and conditions. Groups and conditions allow you to you know, allow you a ton of flexibility uh, in the way that your rule-based matching is going to work essentially allow you to set rules column by column and group by group, establishing multiple match rules, each rule looking for a minimum level of similarity. The next one here is null tolerance, blank or null tolerance. This allows you to tell the engine how you wanna treat blanks or, or null values, either as potential matches or if you wanna require some data in specific fields. Next is the, uh, the, the customizable knowledge-based libraries. It's customizable at the enterprise level. This allows you to uh, remove noise in memory, so you're not actually making any changes to the data. By removing noise, you, you, you tell the match engine to focus more on the signal, right? It's kind of a concept, happy to take you through that. Uh, also allows you to match uh, aliases, such as nicknames, right? Uh, Peggy and Margaret, for example. Also allows you to standardize recurring word variations, again, to get better match results, deduplication results. And it also allows you to dynamically modify any words, values, abbreviations, numbers, patterns, or strings that might help you to get better match results, right? The last one here is cross-column matching. We're gonna look at this during the demonstration. Cross-column matching is often needed. I'll give you a, you know, a common scenario here. Um, you've got, you know, you, you've got a, essentially do some data matching, address matching, or deduplication between two different systems, your CRM and your billing system. Your CRM has a customer name and a single customer address. Your billing system has uh, a customer name and two different customer addresses. Uh, one is for billing and one is for shipping. And sometimes the data in those fields gets, you know, it gets mixed up, right? Uh, you know, sometimes it's centered in one and it should be the other, uh, things like that. And so you're, you're, you're trying to find, you know, the, the match between these two systems, but essentially you've got to match one to many. You've got to match one from the CRM to potentially two other addresses from the, uh, the billing system there. So cross-column matching allows you to do that. It also helps you with misfielding, and we talked about misfielding during part two, when you've got the city and the state field and vice versa. So cross-column matching is very powerful. Um, so in the demonstration, we're going to look at fuzzy matching, knowledge-based libraries, groups and conditions, and cross-column matching um, to hopefully make all of this uh, easier to understand. So let's go ahead and just transition uh, over to the software here and, uh, and take a look at how all of this is, is going to work here. Put a visual uh, to everything that we just talked about here. So I've set up a few different projects here and I'm gonna try to work through this quickly. I can see we're uh, low on time here. So about a minute per, uh, per example. So again, these, these examples have been set up to, uh, to essentially you know, start with very simple examples and to become progressively more difficult, right? To show you some of the, the more advanced uh, configuration. So we're starting here and we're gonna start with an exact match. I really wanna make it clear that exact matching doesn't work, right? The, the types of you know, checks and, and matching and deduplication and, and things like that that you have in your business systems, they just, they aren't nearly as effective as you might need them to be. So if we look here, I've got two sets of data and very minor differences. On this side, everything is an uppercase. In this side, essentially we've got proper case. Now, if we look at it a little bit more in detail, the other difference here is that street has been abbreviated on this side. Here it's written out, 
right? So if I skip over to the match step, everybody should be familiar with the software at this point. I've set up the match and I've set it up to run an exact match on the first three columns, the address, the city, and the state. We run that as a match. And again, we're not gonna see any results there. But let's jump into the, the next example here real quickly. As soon as I set that to fuzzy match, again, our proprietary best in class, fuzzy match algorithm is designed to handle things like this, right? Difference in casing, uh, small word variations, uh, extra characters, missing characters, words out of order, things like that. It's looking for similarity. So the fuzzy match algorithm is gonna be a huge step up if you don't have something like this already in place. Go ahead and run the matching, and now we have that as a match, right? We were able to find those matching addresses. Let's look at the next scenario here. And if we run just you know two or three minutes over today, I apologize in advance, but um, wanna make sure we get through at least uh, all five examples here. So the next uh, scenario here is looking uh, at how we're gonna do this with our customizable knowledge base, right? It's a, a bit more advanced. And why might we wanna use the customizable knowledge base? Well, in this case, you know, again, we have those same issues where we've got the casing, uh, and you know the, the small word variation between ST and street. Uh, but if you look here on this side, California is written out and on this side, it's abbreviated, right? So I'm not gonna go into great detail about why the knowledge base library is a good fit for this type of solution. Happy to have that conversation with you. Uh, but we're gonna jump back to match here. Uh, it's already been set up so we can save some time. And here you can see we're using our knowledge base library. Again, at the, at the enterprise level, this is customizable. So we've set that up and you know what? Let's, let's, let's run it once without the customizable knowledge base here. Let's run the match and just show you that we're not gonna find the match that way. Just because the, the, the abbreviated CA is, is far too you know, dissimilar uh, from the word California right now. So we don't see that as a match. But as soon as I uh, tell the system that uh, you know, California is really CA, I just you know, plug that in as a rule as part of a template, we're gonna see that match here. So really, really powerful data matching and deduplication technique here. Let's go ahead and jump back, open up that uh, next scenario here, open project. And this time we're gonna look at groups and conditions. So again, a lot of the same issues that we saw previously, what's different? Well, on that clean side, uh, the city is listed as Sacramento. On the uh, dirty side here, the city is listed as Hagenwood. Hagenwood is actually a suburb or a township in a city, and we see this quite frequently. It may not be invalid for you know, other intents and purposes. If you send something to this address, it will probably reach its destination. But for data matching purposes, it's another potential challenge here, right? So here we're gonna look at groups and conditions used to handle problems like this. Let's jump back to the match step here. So here, what we've done is we've set it up with two different groups, two different groups of match criteria, right? Uh, each of these groups of criteria looking for a minimum level of similarity. So that first group of criteria here is looking at the same fields we previously looked at, address one city and, uh, and the uh, state here. That second group is, is still a minimum level of, of uh, similarity, and it's looking instead at address one and the postal code. And when we do it that way, we're now able to see the match, right? I'm not gonna show you kind of the before and after here, just because of time. So very, very powerful stuff. Let's go ahead and open up the, uh, the last example here, uh, which is what I mentioned previously, cross column matching. So that scenario where you've got, you know, one address in your CRM, two addresses in your billing system, or when the uh, address parts are misfielded, city and the state column and vice versa. And you can see that here. So what we've done is we've set this up so the city uh, and the state uh, are in the wrong columns, right? And so if we set this up just using that basic criteria, we're not gonna see that as a match. But what we've done here is we've added a third rule and we've remapped the columns, right? This is pretty advanced stuff. I hear this question very, very frequently. Um, it's gonna solve a lot of problems out there. So what I've done here is I've mapped city on the one side to state on the other. So I've mapped them properly uh, in, the, uh, in the first definition here, in the first group, but I've mapped them city to state and state to city uh, in this third uh, group here. 
And when I do it that way, I can start the matching and I'm going to see the results that I'm looking for. So again, all of these are more advanced techniques and I'm, I'm very mindful of the time here. So I want to wrap it up as quickly as possible. These are more advanced techniques. I hope this was really helpful on the, you know, for everyone on the call today. Really appreciate your time, your attendance, your interest uh, in this webinar series. Keep an eye out for next week where, you know, again, I think it's going to be really interesting. We're looking at address verification, postal certification, uh, and other forms of enrichment. Uh, if this was, you know, helpful for you to help, you know, build a business case or helpful for training purposes or just general understanding, you know, please send me some feedback. Uh, you can just respond to the email that goes out. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on LinkedIn. Um, you know, send any suggestions for future webinar topics. Please let me know if this was useful. Of course, you can also uh, buy the software right online if you're looking to do that. So get in touch. We, we appreciate your interest. Thank you for your time today and uh, have a great rest of your week.